I have the um, pleasure to introduce Dr. Adams to you today. Um, I can call him friend. Um, I went to work for Dr. Adams about eight, nine months ago, and I thought I was getting an easy office job. <laughs> Sucker. Sucker. That was not the case. Let me just tell you, for some of y'all that suffer with arthritis and all these debilitating diseases, my hat is off to you. It is hard to get up every morning and, and struggle out and do what you got to do. And the reason a lot of people didn't make it today is not about their hair, mm -hmm. it's because their joints. We see a lot of patients on rainy days that on a normal day, they might be able to walk in just fine, but on a rainy day, they may come in by wheelchair. Um, so I have a new passion for patients that suffer with these diseases and any of you know me that whatever I do I'm going to get a passion about it and I'm just real thrilled to be here today and, and offer this to our community. Um, Dr. Adams is, uh, he has so much education I don't really know where to start. Um, he went to medical school um, at the University of Alabama. Uh, his undergrad was at Sanford University. Um, the one thing that I like to mention, there's two things about Dr. Adams that I like to say to people. One, he has served our country through the Air Force. He's passionate about the service that he did and fought for the men and women of the United States. And he's still very passionate about that. You let anybody walk in that has been or always will be part of the military um, and they have a, a kindred friendship immediately because of that relationship. Um, and the service that they've done, whether they were together or not, they just always find common ground at that point. Um, and then the second thing I always like to say to people is he is a current, um, he's very involved on a national level. Um, he's part of the Committee of Government Affairs um, with the American College of Rheumatology. And, and the patients will ask him, why are you wearing that fork? And I'm going to let him give you the punchline for that. Um, but he not only speaks and talks and walks his game, um, he wears it too. So I, I'd like to introduce Dr. Christopher Adams to the podium. Thank you, Trencia. Uh, she truly did not know what she was getting into when she <laughs> And uh, I'm, I'm grateful for uh, all of her help. So what about the Bent Fork? Uh, the Bent Fork is part of the Simple Tasks campaign from the American College of Rheumatology. And uh, it's to remind folks that things that we take for granted on a regular basis, such as just picking up a kitchen utensil or, or something to eat with, can be very difficult when your fingers are twisted and turned and bent like this. Um, it's, it's mostly uh, an attention getter. It's mostly uh, something to have folks ask me, what's with the fork? Uh, but I'll tell you a silly joke. Uh, the, the chairman of the Governmental Affairs Committee for the American College of Rheumatology says he likes to wear it when he goes out to dinner because he gets a lot of free desserts. People think he's, <laughs> people think he's a food critic. <laughs> so. So with that in mind, um, I would like to echo uh, the speaker who was just before me talking about how important lifestyle is and how important basically uh, how we live is, when, especially when you have a disease. I had a really good friend in medical school, Grosbeck Parham. Grosbeck was the first African-American OBGYN uh, resident at UAB. Grosbeck's over in Africa right now, he's teaching in Zambia. But many years ago when he was the head of gynecologic oncology at the University of Arkansas uh, for medical sciences when I was out practicing in, in Arkansas, uh, he would go around and, and give talks to anybody who, was you know, who would listen. And he talked about health. Grosbeck's par uh, position was, I've seen enough young women die of cancer and now I want to do something to help people prevent it. Well, the, the summary of his very erudite and humorous uh, speech was basically, you got to eat right, you got to exercise, you got to get your spiritual life straight. And, you know, if you do these things, Grosbeck said, then 
your health will follow. Now it's not guaranteed, and it's not 100%, but that's certainly, those are three things that you can do that bypass genetics. They bypass accidents that happen to you and injuries that occur. These are things that you can volitionally do in your life to improve what's going on. So, Grossbeck used to be a bodyguard for Jimi Hendrix. You remember Jimi Hendrix? <laughs> it's hard to argue with a man who used to be a bodyguard for Jimi <laughs> Hendrix. So I'm just going to tell you Grossbeck's right, okay? And that's an echo and a, a medical endorsement of what you just heard about eating right, keeping your spiritual life straight, exercising regularly. So let's talk about a strange disease. Uh, let's talk about ankylosing spondylitis. My objectives are for you to understand a little bit about the background and clinical basis for the diagnosis, um, understand a little bit about how we make this diagnosis in terms of imaging criteria because so much of this particular disease depends on what we see on x-rays, and then look a little bit at the um, treatments for this condition. This is interesting because what we used to call ankylosing spondylitis is in the process of being renamed. Uh, as a matter of fact, twice this morning I've told patients in clinic that about 60% of everything I learned 30 years ago, 35 or more years ago in medical school has turned out to be wrong. We, we've either discovered that what we taught was incorrect or we've advanced our knowledge to such a degree that we realize what we taught was incomplete. So now we call these inflammatory spondyloarthritis conditions, okay? And since inflammatory spondyloarthropathy takes a whole lot of time to type out when you're in an electronic medical record, a lot of times we just abbreviated SPAs. So what we're going to find in the future is when people talk about ankylosing spondylitis, which we previously said was AS, now we're going to be talking about SPAs. Why is this important? Because the spondyloarthritis is a more inclusive group, and it, and it includes some of the other illnesses that we used to subcategorize out. Uh, things like psoriatic arthritis, uh, the arthritis of inflammatory bowel disease, a condition called Reiter's syndrome that can occur uh, as a reactive arthritis following certain kinds of infection, and then uh, the juvenile spondylitis that we, used to, uh, that we see in younger folks. Who gets ankylosing spondylitis? Well, this is probably the one classic rheumatologic disease where men win. Women seem to get more of the other kinds of inflammatory arthritis. They seem to have a higher predominance of lupus, of rheumatoid arthritis, things like that. But here males predominate, and the ratio is roughly uh, somewhere between 3 to 1 and 5 to 1, depending on uh, which particular uh, study you look at. The peak age of onset is very young. These folks start having back pain at an early age, 15 to 30. In fact, uh, one of the criteria for the diagnosis of inflammatory back pain is the onset prior to the age of 45. It's very rare to have this start after the age of 50. Somebody who comes in with back pain, and they're 65 years old, and it just started three years ago, it's probably not spondylitis. It's probably degenerative disease. There's a genetic risk that's associated with this illness, and in some regards, uh, that's responsible for the notoriety of this illness, and that's HLA-B27. The human leukocyte antigens are a uh, number of proteins that are found, particularly on blood cells. And just like blood type allows us to discriminate between different individuals and, and different kinds of cells, the uh, human leukocyte antigens allow us to differentiate between white blood cells that belong to this person versus this person versus this person. There's uh, A, B, uh, C, and then a whole host of Ds, DR, DQ, DW. But the point is HLA-B27 has a very strong association with this illness. It's particularly strong in Caucasians. As many as 90% of Caucasian patients who have this illness are B27 positive. Um, in other uh, races such as African Americans and Asians, Native Americans, uh, the incidence is correspondingly less. Many people misunderstand that HLA-B27 is a necessary 
ingredient for a diagnosis of ankylosing spondylitis. It is not. It's not a diagnostic criteria. Well, let me rephrase that. It is in the diagnostic criteria, but this is not like you're B27 positive, therefore you're going to get ankylosing spondylitis. No, it's not that simple. Many, many people carry this gene and never get the disease. It is, however, a prognostic indicator, by which I mean if you have this illness, you are likely to have a more severe form of the disease if you are B27 positive. So we'd already talked about the fact that this category overlaps with other forms of arthritis, such as psoriatic arthritis, and the arthritis that goes along with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Uh, classic ankylosing spondylitis causes a fusion of the spine and it results in a rigid flex posture. This guy's not just slouching. He doesn't have osteoporosis. He's got a fused spine that does not allow him to straighten up, that forces him to kind of walk over hunched forward staring at his own belly button. Uh, the inability to straighten is uh, a key clinical diagnosis. And again, here this fellow's got his back up against the wall, but he can't touch his head to the back of the door. Uh, he's, he's a good, what, maybe 12 inches away, maybe 14 inches if I, if I guesstimate. And if you look at the x-ray that he has um, that's projected over here on the screen, there's not a gap between the bones in his back. It's a solid white line that runs all the way from up around his jaw, all the way through his thorax and down uh, into the low back. You can also see that the rib cage, the thorax area, is, is significantly curved. This is a, a hallmark of late ankylosing spondylitis. This is what we would like to prevent from happening uh, in our patients, what we don't want to see happen. Uh, he also has the inability to bend forward. So this poor rigid fella is turning into the team. Uh, he can't bend backwards and he can't bend forward to touch his toes. Again, the reason for that is in part because of, and I'm sorry this slide didn't project very well. It became somewhat pixelated when I downloaded it. Um, this, this is in part because there's no flexibility in the low back. All the parts are glued together. Think of a gooseneck lamp. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Okay. Gooseneck lamps are rigid, but they can bend, right? Now think what happens if you put a metal sleeve around that gooseneck lamp. All of a sudden you can't bend it, right? That's essentially what's happening in the situation of an inflammatory spondylitis, is all the, the, the hinges in the gooseneck lamp are getting glued together. This does not project very well on, on the x-ray, uh, but the gentleman also has fairly severe hip disease, and that's part of the reason why he's unable to bend forward and touch his toes as well. So the combination of having a rigid spine uh, in addition to uh, inability to hinge properly at the hips uh, pretty much limits his ability to put on socks and shoes, as you could imagine. The assessment of Spondyloarthritis International Society is known as ASAS, and they've come up with new criteria for the diagnosis of spondyloarthritis. This is all relatively recent. This has all come out within the past, uh, I would say, four years. So it's different than what I was taught in medical school about how we diagnose ankylosing spondylitis. You're still going to find doctors who are practicing and diagnosing under the older uh, criteria set, and that's perfectly okay. I mean, those, those criteria still apply. What ASAS has done is simply expand the criteria set a little bit to make it easier and more cost effective to make a diagnosis so that we can meet, so that we can recognize these diseases at an earlier, uh, at an earlier stage and meet the need to treat patients earlier on in the disease before they get to the point that they're all glued together and can't get their head back against the wall or touch their toes. So they're basically two sets or two arms of the criteria. There's what's called the imaging arm and the clinical arm. And each of these sets is applied to patients who have uh, chronic back pain, which occurs before the age of 45 years. Uh, now, 
A lot of folks have back pain and they don't realize they got back pain because they get into their 40s and they've worked hard all their life in construction or some other physically demanding job and they just think, oh, I just got a bad back. Uh, they don't associate the insidious gradual progression of this disease that can occur over many months and many years with an inflammatory problem. They just think they're getting out of shape and getting old. Um, generally speaking, if you're younger than the age of 45, and don't have a traumatic reason for back pain, uh, then this is something to consider, uh, this, this diagnosis of spondyloarthritis. So the clinical diagnosis requires several things. Um, the clinical arm, in order to have a definitive diagnosis of, of, of spondyloarthropathy, requires an HLA-B27 test and two other clinical parameters. One of them is inflammatory back pain, and we'll talk about what constitutes inflammatory back pain here in just a minute. Another is peripheral arthritis. Enthesitis is a term that a lot of doctors don't even use. Uh, rheumatologists throw it around like it was, you know, jello in a food fight, but enthesitis is an inflammation of where the tendons hook into the bones. So this can cause things like uh, heel spurs, for example, or uh, tendonitis that occurs at elbows sometimes, a golfer's elbow and tennis elbow. Uveitis is a fancy word for really horrible inflamed pink eye, okay, that's not caused by bacteria. Psoriasis is a flaky, uh, irritated skin disease that occurs as a result of inflammation of the skin. Then you can have Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis which are inflammation of, of the guts, uh, either the small bowel or the large bowel. Generally speaking, spondyloarthritis conditions will respond pretty well to non-steroidal drugs, uh, over-the-counter remedies such as Aleve or Advil or even aspirin, prescription medicines like naproxen or meloxicam, uh, Celebrex. Certainly these are all uh, the, the class of drugs called non-steroidals and generally speaking, they work on, on inflammatory back pain. Now, folks that have mechanical back pain, sometimes that is to say pain that's a result of a mechanical injury, a slipped disc, a, a broken back, something like that, they may not respond very well to non steroidal drugs. Family history is important. Uh, generally speaking, if there are other people in your family who have ankylosing spondylitis or seronegative spondyloarthropathy, then uh, your risk goes up partly because we recognize there is a genetic risk. That HLA-B27 thing is a, is a gene that's passed from generation to generation. And then uh, elevated C-reactive protein. C-reactive protein is a barometer or thermometer, if you will, of inflammation in the body. And it tends to go up when there's inflammation and it tends to go back down when there's not inflammation. The problem is it's not very specific and as a consequence you could have a bladder infection, or you could have an infected toenail, or you could have some other disease, flu, for example, bronchitis, that would cause your C-reactive protein to be elevated. So we look for a chronically elevated C-reactive protein in these sorts of, uh, of situations. Let's talk about inflammatory back pain for just a minute. Mechanical back pain often occurs as a result of overuse or injury to the normal spine and its supporting structures. This is what people, you know, who have had a car wreck or whiplash or were injured on the job or lifted too much and threw out their back. Those are all mechanical injuries and they have to do with the parts in the back not fitting properly. On the other hand, inflammatory back pain characteristics generally are um, a little different. The first difference is they come on very gradually. When you ask somebody, when did this first occur, mechanical back pain patients will say, I was on the job at such and such a time, and I twisted, I zigged when I should have zagged, and man, my back, you know, my back hadn't been right since. Or they will tell you, I was in a car wreck on such and such a date five years ago, and my neck ain't been right since. The, the folks who have inflammatory back pain, they say, you know, this has been going on for a long time, but I can't put my finger on when it started. The uh, characteristic of inflammatory back pain is pain at night. Ordinarily, mechanical back pain gets better when you rest. When you quit using the parts that are rubbing together and hurting you, 
and lay down, you get better. Inflammatory back pain paradoxically tends to get worse. Uh, and that gets to an another criteria, which is improvement with exercise. If you have mechanical back pain, if you have a slip disc or, or a crack or a break or parts not fitting right back there, uh, and you go do something, you're just aggravating the broken parts. If you have an inflammatory back pain, uh, the old joke is you don't use it, you lose it. If, if you, you know, what I, I hate, I hate the Celebrex commercial that quotes the physics law that says a body in motion tends to stay in motion, but it's the truth. If you have inflammatory disease and you can keep moving, you do better. So uh, we'd already referred to the fact that the, the criteria include uh, onset at a young age, less than 40, and we'd already referred to the fact that uh, there's generally no improvement with rest. So these are characteristics of back pain that are different than the back pain you get when um, you were trying to move that shrub in the backyard and you thought you could lift it into the wheelbarrow, but it turned out to be, well, yeah, I've been there and done that, okay. One of the forms of arthritis that we see that gives us clues as to uh, spondyloarthritis is called dactylitis. Now, I don't know whether you can fully appreciate this or not, but, but this lady's uh, beautifully uh, painted toenails are uh, kind of eclipsed by the red, hot, swollen little toe she's got, okay? And that red, hot, swollen little toe didn't come from bashing it against the uh, edge of the cabinet. That's inflammation. And uh, we refer to dactylitis uh, in, in plain English as a sausage digit. A lot of times the, the fingers look like, you know, truly they look like little cocktail weenies, okay? <laughs> so uh, that's dactylitis. That's a fairly characteristic form of uh, arthritis that encompasses enthesitis as well. This is not just inflammation of the joint, it's inflammation of where the tendons hook into the bone around the joint. Uh, here's a pretty red hot uveitis, that's the eye inflammation that can occur. And we know this person's had disease for a long time. The reason we know this person's had disease for a long time is look at the pupil, look at the black center of the eye, how irregular it is. Uh, the technical word for that is synechia, but uh, what it really translates into in English is scarring of the iris in the eye so that uh, it can no longer expand and contract properly. Uh, the inflammation has caused uh, scarring there, just like inflammation from a burn causes scarring on your skin. When we see uveitis, it, along with a spondyloarthritis, it's a pretty significant problem. This is somebody who needs something more than just uh, the non-steroidal drugs, more than just some, some Motrin or some uh, naproxen. Radiographically, uh, we can see fusion of the anterior spinous ligament. This is somebody's neck. And I don't know whether, I don't, is there a pointer up here, do you know? Uh, I don't know whether you can appreciate or not, but uh, if you look at the center part of the, the neck, you'll see some gaps. You'll see some kind of gray gaps that extend through the middle part into the back part of the spine away from the jaw. If you look at the front, those gaps are gone. Basically, the bones are all glued together. And that's what we talked about, like you know, slipping a tube down over that gooseneck lamp. This can occur in the uh, lumbar spine as well, and one of the classic findings is so-called bamboo spine. Now, we would rather see people at a clinical stage before this, because when it gets to the point that you're at the bamboo spine and you're uh, experiencing fusion of the anterior ligament, the, the cow's out of the barn, as they say, okay? The, 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 the damage has already been done. The inflammation that, that has gone on as a result of this has progressed to um, a very late stage. But you can see that kind of looks like a piece of bamboo. You, know, you can see the nodes on the, on the stalk of bamboo. So how do we make an imaging diagnosis of spondyloarthritis? This requires really only one clinical parameter plus the presence of sacroiliitis. Now the sacroiliac joints are those joints in your low back that are right at the dimples of the top of your, how did Forrest Gump put it, butox, right? 
So that's at your low back, uh, right where it turns into your butt. The sacroiliitis should show definite radiographic disease. We call it grade two or better. Uh, there should be active inflammation on an MRI, which is suggestive of sacroiliitis. Um, if you don't spend all day looking at sacroiliac joints, this one won't help you very much. But you may be able to appreciate that at the top of these little uh, joints that look like little butterfly wings on either side of uh, the center of, the, of that low, low spine and sacrum, uh, at, at the very top, it looks like little, little creeks or little rivers running down. And the top of those creeks are pretty smooth and pretty regular. And as the creek gets further and further along as it flows down uh, the iliac, it gets narrower and squigglier and more irregular. There is associated, if you can see the whiteness in these x-rays, it seems like these joints are whiter on the bottom than they are on the top. That's called sclerosis, and it's an indicator of inflammation. We can see this more clearly on an MRI scan. And, you know, when I first looked at this picture, I said, oh, look, it's looking like a smiley face. But there's nothing to smile about here. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. I have a twisted sense of humor. The, the left side, again, shows all that whiteness, and, again, and, and that's a, a thickening of the bone as a response to inflammation. You can also see how irregular it is on uh, the one side compared to the other. The, one, the, the, the good side is nice and smooth. The irregular side looks uh, like a map of the Mississippi River as it's flowing through Vicksburg. So how do we treat this? Uh, the current treatment guidelines have been revised just a year ago, and this is according to uh, ASAS and the American College of Rheumatology. This is a really busy slide, so I broke it down into two parts that we're going to look at in just a minute. Uh, but I did want to give uh, Dr. Mike Ward and his group some credit uh, for the work that they uh, did in terms of coming up with these new treatment criteria. I also wanted to use this to mention that unfortunately the insurance companies don't read our journals and unfortunately they don't listen to what's latest and greatest so a lot of times we have to treat you according to what the insurance company says not according to what the most recent treatment guidelines are and those can be significantly different so let's look at active ankylosing spondylitis the first thing we employ is non-steroidal drugs and we use them fairly uh, continuously there was no recommendation for a specific preferred drug, so basically it's just whatever works. If you, uh, the other recommendation is for physical therapy, and this is something that in an age of miracle drugs, sometimes uh, we can overlook. But physical therapy is very important to maintain range of motion and to help patients not get glued into that position of staring at their belly button flexed forwards. We like to stay away from steroids if we can. There are some reasons to use it, but there are many more reasons why we shouldn't. Uh, if the disease remains active, the older recommendation was to use what we call uh, disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, DMARDs. Since this involves some European uh, discussion, they call them SARDs, slow-acting anti-rheumatic drugs. Uh, so at the very top, uh, on, on the uh, other side of the slide. You can see slow-acting drugs, and it's got an X through there, because these really aren't recommended anymore. Unfortunately, your insurance company doesn't know that, and they frequently make us use these drugs before we get to the next step, which is the TNF drugs. The TNFI that's abbreviated there stands for tumor necrosis factor uh, inhibitors. They don't have a preferred drug for treating arthritis, but if you have uveitis or iritis, we generally like to use uh, infliximab or adalimumab. If you have inflammatory bowel disease, uh, any one of uh, these drugs can be helpful as well. If that doesn't, if the first one doesn't work, we try another. So if you have just sacroiliac disease that's causing problems, then we might consider steroid use. We might do some injections. For peripheral arthritis that involves less, uh, less than three joints, one or two joints, again, we might consider an injection. And likewise for the enthesitis. However, we tend not to inject the Achilles tendon and uh, the top and bottom of the kneecaps because those are areas particularly prone to rupture. 
if you have ankylosing spondylitis or spondyloarthropathy, your doctor is going to want to check blood tests regularly. Uh, your doctor is also probably going to recommend that you have back exercises and engage in some self-management education and try to learn how to prevent falls. If your ankylosing spondylitis is well controlled initially, uh, a lot of times doctors will tell you, well, just use your arthritis drugs when you need them, the non steroidals when you, you know, when, when you need it. Um, physical therapy should be continued probably for throughout life. If you have one of these inflammatory conditions, you should probably be doing back exercises every day. Again, we're going to be looking at blood tests on an intermittent basis, and again, we're going to tell you to do all the simple stuff about uh, self-management education and the fall evaluation. What happens when it gets really bad? Well, when it gets really bad, we might have to do joint replacement. And hips are probably the most common place that ankylosing spondylitis patients have to have replacements. Sometimes when people are really bent, uh, there's a technique called osteotomy where uh, folks actually cut the bone in the spine and reposition it and glue it back together. There are f this is not something you want to have done just anywhere on the local corner tattoo parlor, okay? <laughs> you want to go to a really specialized center to have this sort of thing done. Eye disease requires prompt treatment by an eye doctor, an eye specialist, in order to prevent permanent eye damage like we showed you in that picture with the scarred up eye eyeball. And then uh, inflammatory bowel disease generally requires the assistance of a gastroenterologist. So how do these drugs work? How do these TNF-alpha drugs work? Uh, Trent, you help me out on time here. How much time have I got? Okay. Um, the TNF-alpha drugs work by blocking a substance in your body that is created primarily to help fight off cancer. So one of the concerns that people have is when we give these TNF-alpha drugs, are we actually creating a higher risk of cancer? The answer is yes, but not much, okay? Really, really not very much. So as can be shown in this cartoon, the little Y-shaped devices um, that either look like a slingshot or a, or a diviner's rod, whichever uh, you may, grandmama may have told you about those, uh, will bind up to the uh, TNF-alpha molecule, which is represented in this cartoon as a, a, a collection of like three grapes. And it keeps it from gluing the macrophage cell to the target cell. So it keeps these cells from interacting with each other and setting off the inflammation that characterizes uh, inflammatory spondyloarthritis. Uh, some of these medications are uh, chimeric, that is to say a portion of the protein, immunoglobulins are proteins by the way, a, a, a portion of the protein may, may be uh, derived from mice. And the reason from that, for that is it's easy for a mouse to make an antibody against humans. It's a little tougher to get one human to make antibodies against something else that's human. So uh, infliximab is uh, a chimeric, part mouse, part human. Uh, adalimumab, on the other hand, is, uh, is humanized. It's pretty much made all of human parts. And as a consequence, uh, sometimes we don't have, uh, well, let me put it to you this way. Things that are chimeric uh, can lose their effectiveness over time simply because the body recognizes the mouse part and so your body creates antibodies against these antibodies. And it's like the anti-ballistic missiles back during the Cold War, okay? We got the ballistic missiles, we got the anti-ballistic missiles, the ones fighting off the other. Uh, so the more humanized you can get, generally the better off you're gonna be. This is a German slide, so at the bottom you're gonna find uh, monoclonal antibodies spelled in German. But it's the prettiest picture I've found uh, that kind of demonstrates uh, some of the differences between different TNF-alpha, uh, TNF inhibitor drugs that are available. Um, Etanercept works in a slightly different way than the others do, and as a consequence, the receptor on it is uh, 
they, they say that it's a, a fusion protein at the bottom. Uh, infliximab, adalimumab, and, uh, <coughs> and the pegylated version are all shown. And, and it's, you know, there's no test on this at the end. This is just to show you that there are really are some significant basic differences between these drugs. And it's not just, you know, when a doctor picks the drug for you, uh, sometimes it's on the basis of what your insurance company will handle or will cover most of the time. But many times there may be other subtle differences in terms of how these molecules are put together uh, that your doctor is considering in your treatment. So do these things work? Well, it's all about quality of life. That's what we heard about during lunch, right? It's, it's not just about living long, it's about living well. And here is an example of uh, one drug, Humira, compared to placebo in terms of the improvement in people's functional scores. Well, the patient's global assessment uh, for the placebo actually got worse during this trial. That's the, the little uh, set of bars on the, on the farthest left. And about, you know, 38 percent or, or about 38 percent of patients achieved what was called an ASAS-20. That's a series of criteria that we measure to say, have you had an improvement in your disease, okay? About 42 percent said that their total back pain was better. About 43 percent had an improvement in measurement of inflammation. So these illnesses are not just, I mean, these uh, treatments for these illnesses are not simply placebos that were given to people to make them think they're getting better. Uh, they really do tend to have an impact. Uh, the disturbing thing is that these numbers aren't 100 percent. Okay, it would be nice if we had the slam dunk, you know, guaranteed, always works, just give me this doc and I'm cured. Um, we're still working on that one. We, we haven't gotten that treatment yet. But I think you could look at virtually any medication that's FDA approved for the treatment of this condition, any of these monoclonals, uh, the TNFIs, would show you uh, similar sorts of improvement scores. That these things really make a difference for a lot of people. So uh, my summary would uh, suggest that these are serious illnesses. They're uncommon diseases. We don't see them very often. They're accompanied by significant complications. And it's important to treat these illnesses very early so that we can avoid some of these significant complications uh, that might occur later. Uh, there are changing recommendations for treatment. As we can see, uh, these recommendations were published just a couple of years ago. Well, actually, they were derived a couple of years ago. They were published just last year. Uh, unfortunately, the insurance companies don't always get up to speed real fast on this, so sometimes we have to treat you with other medication before we can treat you with the currently recommended treatment. Physical uh, therapy and exercise are vital. Remember what Dr. Grossbeck Parham used to say, you got to eat right, you got to exercise, you got to get your spiritual life straight. One thing I would add to this, because um, you mentioned a vegetarian diet. Um, there is an emerging body of evidence that suggests uh, that your mama was right. She told you you are what you eat, okay? And the simple tragic truth is that Americans these days are eating a lot of pre-processed, pre-formulated, you know, not very natural substances. And as a consequence of some of these preservatives and chemicals and the like, we're probably altering the bacteria that live in your intestines. We don't realize how important these bacteria are until you consider the fact that if you take all the DNA that exists in your body, about 99% of that DNA by weight belongs to the bacteria in your guts. Okay? That's how many bacteria you got <laughs> living in your, in your gizzard. All right? Uh, so really and truly, if somebody gets a little bit uppity with you, you can just look at them and say, you're only about 1% human according to DNA. <laughs> uh, you can mess with them a little bit there. But the, the whole point is, we're starting to recognize more and more the importance of having the right mix of bacteria in your guts. And I'm not a uh, fanatic about 
going all natural. I'm not a fanatic about going all artificial and pharmacologic. I think there's a balance that can be achieved. But one of the things that seems to be important and one of the areas where we seem to have uh, an emerging understanding of how the immune system works is in the gut-associated uh, lymphoid tissue, the gut-associated uh, mucosal uh, uh, immune system. Um, because of this, how you eat and what you eat may make a significant change in anybody who has an inflammatory arthritis condition. And the latest recommendations are that we should all probably adopt more of a Mediterranean-style diet. And that's a little less meat, a little less, um, well, a whole lot less fried food, and uh, a little bit more attention to uh, more, I, I don't want to use the term organic, but I'll say natural uh, kinds of food, fresh food, and uh, preparing vegetables in a healthier way. Um, I'll go back again to my buddy Grossbeck. Um, during one of his talks, I sat down and listened to that he gives to community groups such as this. Um, he kept talking about fried chicken and how bad fried chicken is for you. And at the end of the talk, I said, Grossbeck, I think you're the only man alive who can say fried chicken and make it sound like a cuss word. <laughs> <laughs> he, said, he said, let me tell you, there's only one person on earth that I don't tell not to eat fried chicken. And I said, who is that? He said, my 84-year-old mother. <laughs> so she made it to 84. The fried chicken obviously didn't do it to her. Okay. <laughs> so, the, the, but the point is we should, we should pay attention to these things. So, you know, the, the quick and easy route, stopping at home for, you know, McDonald's or stopping to get the freeze-dried whatever out of the fridge and pop it in the microwave, that's probably not the way we need to be eating. And it's certainly not what's going to be healthy for our guts. Uh, then the question arose, what about all the probiotics? You know, are, do, do I need to be taking this acidophilus stuff and all these other things to see if that's going to improve it? The jury's still out on that, but there does seem to be some preliminary evidence if you're a rat that that'll be beneficial. Okay. <laughs> now, I don't mean to imply that y'all are rodents. I simply mean to say that we're allowed to do these experiments on lab animals, you know, where we sacrifice them at the end and look at what the lymphocytes in their guts are doing. Uh, we really haven't gotten the IRB uh, approval to do that in human beings yet, so I, I can't tell you that would work real well. At this point, I'd like to stop and, and take any questions that y'all may have. Uh, about about this condition, about its diagnosis, or about its treatment. Well, I just had one. I guess when you made the differences to um, with um, I guess the tumor necrosis factors inhibitors that goes along with um, NSAIDs, and the NSAIDs go with it as an exercise. If you add um, anti and antioxidants, so that help increase that. I guess that would also improve the diet also. Right, and um, the idea of antioxidants is a wonderful concept. Unfortunately, when we try to do uh, so-called randomized uh, placebo-controlled clinical trials, where we say, "Okay, we're going to give you, we're going to, we're going to take 200 people, we're going to give 100 of them this stuff, we're going to give the other 100, um, you know, the the, plac the sugar pill," we we can't see a big enough difference there. Okay. I will tell you, though, that studies have shown that chemicals like resveratrol, and that's the stuff that's in the black cherry juice that people with gout for years and years have been telling their doctor works, we now know why. Resveratrol is an antioxidant. It's also very anti-inflammatory. We know that, for example, the small chain fatty acids and the uh, medium chain fatty acids that exist in Mediterranean style diet will actually change the immune system in a, in a rat's gut, okay? That the bacteria metabolize these chemicals in a different way, such that it modulates the immune system and keeps it from being so hyper-reactive and, and auto-reactive so you don't get these autoimmune diseases. So, yes, we're in the process of learning more about this. Does that mean I would go out and buy every antioxidant on the shelf? No, I wouldn't do that. 
Uh, but I, I think that that's something that we ought to pay attention to, especially the more natural antioxidants. I, that was a very long answer. I hope it uh, got yeah, your question. Well, that's about the same thing about the debt associated with the coastal alignment that you said that would um, sort of increase when you start talking about decreasing the suppressor cells, that sort of decrease the amount of um, cells that are going to produce that on spinal Yes, and, and it's all about balance, okay? The, I, I tease people that the older I get, the more Chinese I become. It's all about yin and yang, okay? It's all about, you know, the helper cells, the suppressor cells, and the macrophages, the lymphocytes, the, you know, NK cells. All of these have to be in the right balance. And as I watch the Olympics, and especially as I watch that dual diving competition that I've never seen before, I don't know how I missed that, but... I mean, these guys are like synchronized. How do they do that, you know? Well, they do it by hours and hours of practice. How does your body do it? It does it by balancing out through these cytokines, through these signals back and forth. Do I need more of this? Do I need more of that? Disease occurs when those things fall out of balance. And so, yes, sir, uh, I think that we're, our understanding of how to get the harmony back uh, is improving, and I think we're going to find that a lot of this goes through a more natural uh, pathway. Well, uh, you know, pH has something to do with it, but uh, really and truly, it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd have to pull out some serious uh, flow charts in my biochemistry background to, to get into it further than that, but. Um, it, it, it gets it gets real complicated real quick, uh, but but yes, sir. It's about it's about finding the harmony. Appreciate your time, and uh, thank you for listening. All right. On behalf of the Destination D, this Eminent Solution and New Thing Community Development Incorporated, we'd like to thank you for taking your time and take time out of your busy schedule on today and coming to present this um, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful um, topic. We are very generous. Thank you, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. I got it. <laughs>